The fellowship is a place where we are unashamedly passionate for Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Savior of the world. The fellowship is a place where lives are changed and every person counts, where love is a way of life and where young and old, rich and poor, strong and weak, all become family. The fellowship, a place where the world is reached with the mercy and the heart of God, where the nations gather to celebrate Jesus Christ, where many cultures, ethnic groups, and languages come and proclaim the greatness of our God. The fellowship where the timeless words of Jesus are shared with passion, freshness, where the Bible is explained so that all ages can understand and be empowered by the life in its pages, where truth is important, where your faith is challenged and strengthened. The fellowship where the broken and the needy and the hurting are as important to us as they are to Jesus where every voice is heard, where every heart is embraced. The fellowship is a place of song and dance and joy, a place of intimate worship and praise that will change your whole view of church music. The fellowship, a place of prayer and caring, a place with many friends, a place you can call home. wanted to just keep you acutely aware of the sacrifice of the Lord. Uh, I want to keep you acutely aware that in order for us to live, he had to die. Uh, that, that is something that we, we see every day. We see it every day. We see when we go and eat a piece of beef or chicken or fish we just don't, we see it, but we don't seem to stop and think something died. You know, we don't quite look at it like that. But more than the natural, Jesus died that you and I might live. And I don't want to ever forget it. I don't want to ever forget that God became a man and gave his life for me because that was the only way out of the predicament that we were in, the dilemma that we were in. We, we were in a dilemma. Christianity is not just some shallow religion. Amen. And it's not what many in the world believe it is. It is something greater than that. It's something that is initiated by God and, and fulfilled by God and brought to a conclusion by God. That's what it is. I, I want to talk a little bit about it because I think so often we don't grasp that as we should. We do in some, to some degree, but as we should. My series, the series here is The Blood of His Cross, and today I wanted to basically talk about uh, Jesus being the high priest of the good things to come. My version, New King James, says he's high priest of the good things to come. Or you might say he is the high priest, our high priest of the good things that have come in that he brought them into reality. So we often live beneath our privilege. We often live beneath what Jesus has wrought for us through his death and his resurrection. We often make Christianity about us and about uh, our well-being and how we feel and what God wants to give us. We make it about that and I do think that is a minuscule part but it is not the center of Christianity. Christ is the center and he is everything that God wants us to be and he's given him to us. Therefore we must receive him. We must we must uh, eat him, as it were. We must drink him every day. 
the, the Lord gave the old covenant to paint pictures for us. He did not give us that old covenant for us to go back there and live. I know a lot of Christians talk about the old covenant and uh, a lot of Christians are trying to become more Jewish and do those old covenant things, but that's really wrong. I mean, it's very wrong, and, and I don't want to uh, fight about it, but it's just wrong because that was not the reality. I mean, that was not the reality. It was a prefiguring of something. Uh, it, it didn't have the ability to do what God was showing us that was going to be done. So I want to talk about that. Let me read a little bit here from Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 9, uh, for the sake of time, let's start in verse 9. He says here, the, the author says, it was symbolic for the present time. And when he says that, he's actually catching us up because he's talking about all the things that were done in the tabernacle, that is where, uh, where they, the priest offered sacrifices and gifts to God. He says all these things were symbolic, even the tabernacle itself, how it was configured. You had the outer court uh, where people congregated, but they didn't, they didn't go inside to the inner court, and they didn't go inside to the Holy of Holies. And, all, and so the writer is telling us that this was a symbolic, or it was a lot of symbolism. And when he says that, he wants you to understand that God was up to something. Yes, God was up to something, and I, I'm so glad because uh, my dad, when he would have a difficult job, he would ask me, are you up to it? And uh, the, the young people don't know what that means. But, but dad wanted to know if I had the strength, if I had, uh, as it were, the intestinal fortitude, if my mind uh, were made up, if it were made up, if I was willing to go through whatever I needed to go through to get the job done. That's what he meant. And so I want you to know that God was up to this thing. He was up to bringing us out of our dilemma. A dilemma means you have no favorable option. And he was up to that. And so he lets us know that all the things that he ordered Moses to do were symbolic. That, that, that's, I could just shout right there. It says it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to con conscience. So these things were offered, but God knew that they could not make the offerer perfect. It could not make him who performed the service perfect perfect in regard to conscience. Now, let me get ahead of myself. In case I don't get there, you'll already have the information. But when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, when he went into the tabernacle, he went into the Holy of Holies, and he sprinkled the mercy seat, it could not make his conscience perfect. It could not cleanse his conscience. It was only something that was external. We don't want to go back to what was only external. He says here, because it was concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly, fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Verse 11, but Christ came. Now he shows you, uh, he says this against what was done previously. He says, but Christ came. But Christ came, what? As high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is not of this creation. And so when the Bible talks about uh, not made with hands, he's talking about something that is not of this creation or that is not earthly. The first tabernacle was earthly. It was, as it were, of this creation, though made as a copy of the true it was not of this creation. But Christ came. But Christ came to usher in a new era as high priest of 
good things, the good things of God, the, God, the real intention of God, the desire of God. Jesus came and ushered that in for us. Then the writer tells us in verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves. Don't you love how he writes? And you can only write like that when the Holy Spirit is, is the author. And the Holy Spirit says, but Christ came. There was a hopeless situation, but Christ came. He came as a high priest. He came to, to, to bring in a new era. He came to bring in the reality of God. And then he says that he came with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves. So he's showing you the inferiority of the blood of animals, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. I love that. But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place, not, not on the earth. He was not a priest on the earth, but he entered the most holy place in heaven once for all, having, when he entered, Having obtained, having laid hold of, having secured eternal redemption. Wow. Eternal redemption. Now, now, notice he did not say he obtained temporary redemption. I want to say this not to the person who says, I am saved, but there is no change. I'm not talking to that person. I'm talking to somebody who has been truly saved. Perhaps you still struggle. You still have your issues, but you are always stumbling toward God. You're not running away. You're going toward him. You're trying the best you can. You're doing everything you can. And you fall sometimes, but you're reaching for him. I want you to know you're going to make it because your making it is not predicated on your effort. Your effort is there because of what he has done, but it's not predicated on that. It is predicated on the offering of himself. Hallelujah. He's amazing, isn't he? The Fellowship is a place where we are unashamedly passionate for Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Savior of the world. Where the nations gather to celebrate Jesus Christ. A place of intimate worship and praise, where lives are changed. A place of prayer and caring. A place with many friends. A place you can call home. has already obtained eternal redemption. I'd like to say to you that Jesus has only one kind of salvation to give you, eternal. He has only one kind of redemption to give you, eternal. He has only one inheritance to give you, eternal. So the writer, this has made me happy already. But there's more. He says, for if for if, were it possible, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Let's read that again. I, I, I love that. I don't want you to miss the point. For if, this is under the old covenant, the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh how much more he's talking to Hebrews who are being tempted to go back to ritual they are listening to the propaganda of their day you and I listen to the propaganda of our day sometimes we it, it foils us it causes us to make decisions that are not good and we listen to too much television and too much talk radio and too, too many 
of the cable news shows and we know more about what they think than we know about what God thinks and I don't want to get my information from people who are perishing. I don't want a thief to tell me don't steal. I don't want a person who's been divorced 10 times tell me how to stay married. I don't want somebody going to hell telling me what's right and what I ought to do. So he says, this one, Jesus, how much more if the blood of animals can be effective to purifying the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, and now notice, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So he says to you, that he says to you that when Jesus Christ comes, Jesus Christ will cleanse your conscience from dead works from things that don't matter, from things that don't profit. He will cleanse your conscience. That's huge, isn't that? Isn't that amazing that the blood of Christ washes the conscience of men? So no, we don't want to trade him for anything in the world. We, we were talking earlier, several, several were talking earlier, I think it was Bishop Ramad about uh, about America or, or Pastor Burke, but talking about America and all the good things that, that happen here. And I, I think sometimes the good things here are an enemy to us. It's the way we process, you see. We want to live to enjoy them. And we don't think about the fact that 1 John 3.16, 1 John, not John 3.16, 1 John 3.16 says that Jesus laid down his life for us so we ought to also be armed with the attitude that we will lay down our lives for our brethren. I think some of us think that's un-American. It is scriptural. And that's where God is bringing us. Not so, I, I've got it so well, I want to enjoy it. I want to live to enjoy it. No, I don't want to die. I'm too young. I'm, I'm just 82. I want to live to enjoy it. You know. So God is doing something in us. I believe he's transforming us by the reality of Christ. That's this reality. Now the writer goes on to say, and for this reason, for this reason that Christ offered himself through the eternal spirit, the Holy Spirit, without spot to God. He says, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of Death, not of, by means of life, but by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. That those who are called, those you and, uh, and me, that those who are called may receive the promise of a temporary inheritance. No, may receive the promise of what? Of eternal inheritance. So God has only one kind of inheritance to give his children. Eternal. And he explains, he explains the power of it. He says, for where there is a testament or where there is a will, a will, a last will and testament. You know what that is? You write your will out and it's, not, it's in force when you die. And uh, nobody can change it. And so he says, for where there is a testament or a will, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. There must be of necessity that death. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood, now notice the writer wants us to, to, he juxtaposes or parallels, lay side by side the difference between animal sacrifices and, and Christ's sacrifice. He says, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, now as he did this, he was saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God 
has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. Notice he, he sprinkled the tabernacle and he sprinkled all the vessels of ministry. All of us are vessels of ministry and all of us have received the blood of sprinkling. I, I think that is so great, so huge in that you and I are cleansed by the blood of Christ. We approach the throne of God without fear. We approach the, the throne of God not like strangers or foreigners, but we approach the, the throne of God covered with the blood of his son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the writer goes on to say in verse 22, and, and according to the law, almost, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so he shows you why Christ had to suffer. I think this is so big for us. I think that we can't leave here without really knowing it. I don't mean knowing it as it were intellectually, but knowing it deep in our hearts, having it uh, erupting from our gut as it were, that we would know that we have been purchased at great price. The writer goes on to say, therefore, verse 23, it was necessary that the copies of the heavenly things in the heavens should be purified with these. The copies should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So he shows you that it was all right for the copies to receive the animal blood, but that's not the reality. The reality needed something more real, as it were. It needed something eternal. And so what God has done for us cannot be undone. You know, the, you know, there's a scripture that says he has stretched forth his hand. And the writer asks, and who can make him draw it back? So God has stretched forth his hand to bless you. He has initiated your salvation. He has initiated your sanctification. He has initiated your glorification. And that means that nobody can say, stop right here, God. That's enough. I, I like this truth. So Jesus is the high priest over all of this, making sure that it, it comes to pass. So, so his blood makes sure it's come to pass. And the Bible says that he, that he, um, he has this power, this, this amazing power, and it's called the power of an endless life. So there's no way in the world that things can be changed because he is making intercession for us. He, he will never die. There will never be another high priest. I love that. Now notice what he says in verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands. So when he says made with hands, he's speaking of this creation. So Christ has not entered anything on this side or earthly that's made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to what? Appear. Now to what? Appear in the presence of God for us. And so Christ's appearance in heaven before God is our intercession. So his life is interceding. His blood intercedes for us. When he got to heaven, he sprinkled the mercy seat. And, and that's so amazing. Maybe we can reiterate that later. But in, in, the, in the first tabernacle, I'll talk about it perhaps later if I have time. But in the first tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, you had the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with gold. And inside, you had the law. The broken law. You had the tablets of a broken law. And so the high priest would go in once a year on the day of atonement and sprinkle the mercy seat with blood. In other words, what God will see is not the broken law. He will see the blood. And so Christ has entered heaven itself. Now notice what he says, to appear in the presence of God for us. He is our representative. He is our forerunner. 
So that should give us confidence that we're not just going to struggle through this life and, and oh, Lord, I hope I make it. And, you know, we're going to have an abundant entrance into this kingdom. In verse 25, he says, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest. You see how he is contrasting his work with the high priest, the earthly high priest. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. With the blood of another. Then he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared. So we saw the second appearance. The first one, he appeared, it says he appeared in the presence of God. And so now he's telling us that he has now appeared. Why did you appear, Jesus? To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The high priest could never ever put away sin. He could just cover it for a year. So this sacrifice is much greater. What I want you to understand is that what God has done for you is so big, nobody can touch it. No one can take it back. No one can annul it. You're an overcomer, and that's a settled issue. We trust you were blessed as you viewed today's broadcast. If you have enjoyed it, please call to write and let us know. You may own this message in its entirety by requesting the tape number as shown on your screen. Corpus Christi Christian Fellowship, demonstrating the love and compassion of Jesus Christ.